Hi there, and welcome to Hope Lutheran Church, and welcome to the fourth installment of the sermon series I'm calling, What Kind of Christian Do I Want to Be? And today we're not talking like we did last week about all the different things we can do, the quantity of things that we can do to show our appreciation with God. Today we're talking about the quality. We're asking a question, am I giving God my best? Are you giving God your best? Today we're going to see a great example of someone giving their best, and then we're going to see the source of where that attitude came from. This is a message you're not going to want to miss, so come, join us, let's learn from our Lord. All right, let's go to back to physics, high school physics, college physics, wherever you learn physics. Do you remember the law of convection? Do you remember that? Kind of, sort of, kind of, maybe, uh, probably not. Pastor, just tell us what convection is. Convection is, in the basic form, the transferring of something to another. We see it in the science world when we talk about usually heat. The law of convection is the thing that if you touch the top of the stove, you get burned because the heat is transferred through the stove to you. But we also hear it through nature. God invented the law of convection in the world of nature, and we see it all the time. We see it here in Minnesota. We see it uh, all around the world. You see it whenever you look outside right now and look at snow, you have the law of convection. And basically what the nature's form of the law of convection is, is the way God set it up was the sun is warm enough that it will go to the water on the earth. And it heats it up enough that that water becomes vapor. It's happening right now all around us. That vapor rises and it collects in what we call clouds. Those clouds collect enough vapor that as they travel, they become so heavy that it falls back down in the form of rain, cold enough snow, so that it comes and it fills back up the lakes, and it happens again. Heat rises, it collects, it falls, and we call it a rainstorm. That's God's, what we call the, the law of nature, the law of convection. And with that, you see God's wisdom. It's able to transfer water from here to there. It's able to transfer water up here down to water down there that needs it. And through snow, it's able to store up so that we have water waiting for us in the, summer, in the springtime. This is also the way that God teaches us to handle the blessings that he gives to us. God has set it up where he is the source of all blessings. Blessings like time. Many of us in our day and age have the blessings of time. We have so much free time that God has given to us. Time that we can't get back, but plenty of time in front of us. So he gives us the blessing of time. He gives us all blessings of talents. All of us are able to do things that the next person can't do. All of us are specifically made and we are made to do things to help out the corporate uh, entity. But also, God says that I'm giving you individual talents, individual things that only you can do, that you can do that's better than us. So time, talents, and he's given us treasure. I'm going to give you blessings like food. I'm going to give you blessings like a job. I'm going to give you, through your job, I'm going to give you a paycheck so that you can do and you can take all of these blessings. Now, what he is saying then is, when you give back, you are now going in the law of convection. You are now giving back to God so that he can go and transfer those things elsewhere. So the law of convection for nature is the same for us, one of God's favorite principles. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about this. He says, remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And what he is teaching us there is, when we give back to God, there is a tie in the kind of blessings that he gives to us. The more we give, the more God is going to 
bless us. Maybe bless us personally. Maybe bless the person down the road through our efforts. But the more that we give up and the quality we give up has a direct relationship with the amount of blessings that he will pour on. Maybe to us, maybe to the person down the road. And that's where the whole theory of convection doesn't make sense for us anymore. I might have had you with the whole idea of rain. I might have had you with the whole idea of snow and, okay, I get the clouds and I get all that. But for us, and if you're like me, the first thing you think of is, you know what, the more I give to God, the less I'm going to have. The more I give to God, the more unhappy I am going to be because it feels better to have this. So with that, I'm going to be hesitant on giving to God because I'm not, it's not going to make me feel good because I'm going to feel like I have less because I'm not really believing or trusting that God is going to bless me by more, the more I give. And as we're looking at today, the quality that I give, if I give God my best, well, you know what? I deserve my best. I deserve the first fruits. I deserve the prime cut of my blessings. I deserve these things. I'm the one doing these things. So I'm hesitant on giving back to God. And when I do give back to God, I'm not so sure that I give my best to God. And we have all the excuses. We have all the excuses in the world. It really doesn't matter your age. If you are in elementary school, well, I have nothing to give God and I can't give God my best because I got nothing. I'm literally living on a hand to mouth relationship with my parents. I eat whatever my parents buy. I live in whatever my parents give me. I have nothing, so how could I possibly give back to God? How could I possibly give God anything of quality? We get bigger. Um, high school age. You know what? You have your first job. You have so little. And so with that, you got to scrape. You can't give back to God. The time you have, the talents you have are just forming. The treasure you get is just small. I'm just scraping by here. I don't have the ability to give God back anything of value. Go on. You get older. College age. I have too much debt. I can't possibly give to God. Uh, you just get out of college. I'm just getting started. I need to get my feet on the ground first, and then I can give back to God. And then I can give back to God something of quality. And then you get older, and now you start having kids. They need your best. They need the, um, your resources, your time, your talents, your treasure. And with that, I have very little to give to God. And then finally, once you're retired, well, then you have that, those two words, right? Fixed income. I can't possibly give back to God because I'm on a fixed income. I don't have that ability anymore. I used to have it, but not anymore. And so Satan loves to fill us with all kinds of different excuses for us not to give back, but also to give back God a sliver. Give back to God just a little bit. Give back to God good and not nearly our best. Because why? Because if anybody deserves our best, it's us. If anyone deserves the fruits of our labor, it's us. And you know what? God doesn't need it. And God really won't notice if I give God my best, considering where we're at. And so I want to show you this amazing account. And yeah, I know all pastors think every account is amazing. That's true. But Jesus thinks it's an amazing account, and you're going to see it in the way he acts. And so because Jesus thinks this is an amazing account, that's why I can say this time for certain, this is an amazing account that I want to share with you. I want to share with you Luke chapter 21. And with it, we are seeing Jesus on the Tuesday of Holy Week. Okay? So with that, as you know how Holy Week goes, he is on a Tuesday here. Then there's obviously Wednesday. Thursday night, he is, uh, is Paul, or Thursday night is Monday, Thursday, and he's going to be arrested. So he's about 48 hours away from being arrested, about 72 hours away from being crucified. And so you would think, I mean, I mean if, I, if that were me, if that were you, I, I bet you I know what you would be doing in 72 hours, preparing your defense. What are you going to say to Pilate? Because you know that's coming. Gather up your strength because you know that the blows are coming from your father, to be punished. Uh, but we see Jesus, and he's in the temple. And he's in the temple, and you know what he's doing? He's people watching. Uh, I don't know if you're a 
fan of people watching. It's one of our, our, my favorite pastimes. That's why I'm so happy that the, uh, the state fair is back in business, because uh, we were able to go with it. I just love just sitting. What Jesus is doing right here, just sitting and just watching people. All different shapes and sizes and hair colors and uh, clothing colors and, you know, choices. And, and it's just great to watch people. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's people watching. But he is sort of taking their temperature. Where are these people at? Where is their faith life at? I've been with these people now three years. I've taught them. I've shown them I'm the Messiah. I've shown them I'm God by doing the miraculous. Where are they? Where, where's their head at? And so he goes to the offering section of the temple, and this is where we pick up our account. Uh, our text begins by saying, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. And many rich people threw in large amounts. That last part is the part that I want to focus on with you. Because you have to sort of fully understand what is going on here to fully appreciate what Jesus is doing. In a few moments, we're going to be having, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be having our offering where you can give your offering. We have music in the background and, you know, it, we usually put in something, you know, it's very quiet and maybe you chit chat with the person next to you, but not so then. Um, here's a little depiction of it. If you can see it, you see a copper like vase at the top. And then at the bottom would be the box, and that's where your money would go. Now, that copper vase obviously is made out of copper. So that, is the, that would lend for a very noisy situation. And people, especially rich people, would take advantage of this situation. Because what they would do is they would make sure that they would not just put the money in the hole nice and quiet. They would make sure that that money was poured in, what they say, thrown in to the copper. And I'm just going to illustrate for you what it might have sounded like so that you can understand maybe why they would have done this. This is not copper. This is something more high tech than copper, but you get the point. So you have the copper opening and you have just coins. And this is what it would have sounded like. Right? Loud. Loud stuff. Now, why? Why would they make sure, especially the rich people, that it was very loud? Well, so that you knew that they were very rich. So that the, you knew that these people who are very rich were very blessed by God. They must have been doing something right. They must be doing something right because, remember, they're thinking of a transactional God. The more you give to God, the more God is going to bless you. And the more that you do for God, the more God is going to bless you and do for you. Because God needs you and needs these things. And so these people would pour in and pour in and pour in to show everybody, look at how God loves me. Look at how valuable I am to God. Look at how God needs me. Look at how important I am. And now look at how I can be blessed and expect to be blessed by our Lord because of what I'm willing to do for them. And while that happens... Jesus is unimpressed. He's watching this, and he's probably not liking what he's seen because they are now believing, or they have believed, that if this is a transactional situation. They're now expecting God to bless them in ways that God may not want to. So their idea of grace is gone. Their idea of free love from God is gone. It is all transaction. But then something catches Jesus' eye. As, these noise, as this noise is going on, as all this is happening, Jesus is unimpressed until this happens. But a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny into this. This would be even smaller than our denomination of a penny. This would be a fraction of a penny. These would be small copper um, not that much more thick than a wafer of, uh, of bread that we have for communion. Smaller, maybe the size of maybe your, your uh, pinky nail. And she put in two of them. And for Jesus, whoa, that's what he noticed. That is the one that caught up Jesus' attention. If Jesus was slouching, now he is sitting up. Whoa, did, and he turns to his disciples and he says, calling his disciples to him, fellas, did you see this? Did you see that? Did you see what I just saw? He says to them, I tell you the truth. 
This poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. Now remember, being poor is obviously, you know, we have that today. We read that last week. We're always going to have people that do not have enough, do not have as much as others, poor people. But this woman is a widow, which means that there is no safety nets back then. There's no social security. There's no health insurance. There's no life insurance. When her husband died, she got zero. And usually women did not make the money during that time. They were handling the food. They were handling the family. It was a husband that was making the money. So she had little and she was able to earn little. And because she was older, the opportunities to go and learn and earn were not there. So she was able to scrape up though two small copper coins, and that's what she gave. And Jesus noticed it right away. Fellas, whoa. He says, calling his disciples, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. These other people, they gave out of, the, out of their wealth. Yeah, they gave, right. Yes, they gave. But she, out of her poverty, she gave her best. She gave everything. She gave all that she had to live on. They gave because they had to. They gave because this is what you do. You give back to God, but her heart says, I'm going to give God my best. And my best is two copper coins. A couple things to notice. She could have given one, right? She could have given one and kept the other, but she knew her Lord. She knew that her Lord loved her, and so she was willing to give her best back to her Lord. This is the way that she thanked her Lord for what he did for her by giving back her best. She trusted that even though I'm giving this, I'm not going to be without. The Lord is going to continue to provide for me because I'm his child, because he has promised to provide for me, because he has promised to bless me when I give my best. A couple things to also notice. You notice, I doubt that she ever knew that this happened. You know, there's a very good chance she didn't even know she was in the same room as the Lord. That didn't matter to her. She probably didn't even notice that Jesus was watching. Didn't matter to her. This was between her and God. And I doubt she even knew that this would be recorded so that we could study this 2,000 years later and see her as an example. But for her, it didn't matter. This was between her and her Lord, and she wanted to give God her best. The best she could do is give him the two small copper coins. Last thing that I hope you noticed. You notice Jesus didn't stop her. It's because Jesus loved getting her best. You notice he could have said, little old lady, whoa, 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 stop, stop, guys, 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 fish that out. Fish back one. We, We don't need that. God loves our good, but he loves our best. And he is tied to the promises he made, that God made, that I will continue to provide for this woman. More so, I will continue to go on this journey to the cross so I can die for this woman, so that I can spend eternity with this woman. She knows this, and with that, she wanted to give God her very best. So what an example. And with that, as we close our sermon series here, I think God wants us to know something that can be very striking to us. If you're filling in the blank, here's your uh, blank. As a Christian, I want to give God my best, which actually means actually giving God my best. We very, it is very easy for us to fall in the temptation of giving God our sliver, giving God what's left over, giving to God our good, giving to God our excuses. But when God says, I, I, would, I would love your best, he sees that. He knows that. He appreciates that. And it is one of the best ways that we can show that we indeed are his children by giving God our very best. A couple of things I want to, to see. If this is something that you're struggling with, if you look back and you say, you know what, there's been times I have not given God my best. He's gotten my good. He has gotten my leftover. He has gotten my, oh, right, yeah, I guess I should. You have a Savior that has given you an example. An example that you hear today of someone that gave God her best. So God gives you this example of a woman that did this not to gain favor with God. But like we talked about with the kids, this is her way of thanking God. 
So look to this as an example, if you're looking for an example of what Jesus knows and sees and appreciates. The second thing is, is you look to the cross. There's your source. There's where you look to because Jesus went to the cross even for those times we give God our zero or our scraps or don't treat him like he deserves to be treated. He went to the cross for those. He died for those. He washed you clean and me clean of those things. Look to him for the source. Because not only did he die for those sins, he died for all of the sins. So that we can continue, and even though we struggle with this, spend eternity with our Lord. And then look out. Because God has given you opportunities. God has given you time this week. How can you give God your best in that time he has given you? He has given you talents. How can you give God your best through your talents? Because they can be used. And he's given you treasure. How, has, how can you give God your best through your treasure? But when you do know this, God, Jesus notices these things, just like he did with her. He notices when you give him your best. He loves it. He smiles. He cheers when you give him your best because he knows what you value from him, and you recognize who he is. He loves it, and he will bless you and the kingdom through it when you give him your best. Let's go to our Lord, and let's speak to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, you don't need us, but you want us. You don't need anything that we can do or even offer you, but you love it when we use our talents and our treasure, and our time for you, and give you our best. And we know that you are especially happy and proud when we worship you and reflect you in here, in your house, as well as out there in the mission fields you have placed us in. Open our eyes now and give us boldness so that we can show our trust in you and our love for you, and make you look good in everything that we do. Amen. Hi there. I'd like to take just a moment here just to talk to you about how you can now respond in a real way to the hope and joy this Christmas season that's waiting for all of us because of what Jesus did for us. Did you know that when you give to God through hope, you're giving to over 20 different ministries? Maybe you've heard me say that before. But one of the ways that you actually give and change the world is by equipping men to go out and preach the news, the good news, to other people all around the world. Did you know that when you support Hope, one of the ministries that we support is the seminary that I graduated from, Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary. It's located in Mankato. And our offerings, some of our offerings, go to support that. When you give to Hope, either online or in person, you are supporting that place. You are supporting that wonderful school, a school after my own heart. I could not be here. I would not be able to have the talents cultivated and nurtured the way I have if it wasn't for the seminary. When you support Hope, you are supporting men to go out and preach that good news to all people. People around the world, people around the United States, people here in your state, wherever you're at. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for the support that you have given to God through hope in the past. If you haven't given, maybe this is a good time now for you to go online and give a donation or even better, a reoccurring donation to God through hope so that you can not only support the ministries we have here, but also make a change for people in the world. Thank you for those of you that have given in the past. Thank you for your generosity. It was a pleasure serving you. Thanks again for letting us be part of your weekend. As always, if I can do anything for you, please let me know. Otherwise, Lord's blessings as you enter your mission field now. And always remember that because of Jesus, you have hope. <laughs>